Welcome, folks, to a very special video. It's another two-part interview with someone who worked on Ace Lightning. This time, I'm interviewing someone who wrote episodes of both seasons of the show, Mark Laren Young. This interview is roughly the same length as my interview with actor Brandon Carrera, so it's broken into two parts. Both parts see us talk about Mark's very, very rich and varied career as a writer, but specifically we cover the early days, and his work on an episode of the Beast Wars Transformers CGI animated series. I love that show. Then for part two, we cover Ace Lightning. I'll say quickly, if anyone out there is watching who was a part of Ace Lightning, in front of the camera or behind it, Mark sends his best regards to you all, as do I. You did amazing work that's really important, and I want you to know this. This interview is an amazing opportunity, and we both had a blast. Before we continue, feel free to like, share, and subscribe to the channel, hitting that notification bell for when my videos go live. Stay tuned to the channel for more Ace Lightning content. So without further ado, let's talk to Mark Laren Young today. So hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great, William. How are you doing? I'm really great, yeah. So um, this is an interview I'm doing with you. I have some questions um, about some of the work that you've done with uh, Ace Lightning is the big one for me. It's one of my favorites from, from when I was a kid. It's really important to me. But also uh, Beast Wars. Wow. Yeah. That should be fun to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I was actually, I was on uh, IMDb, and I think that's uh, that's how I found some of the writers for Ace Lightning, and uh, I saw I saw your photo there, and I found uh, some of your other credits. I'm like, oh, he did Beast Wars. Oh, that's my, that's one of my favorite things ever. I have to, I have to do this. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I have, uh, I have a few questions just, uh, just here, but, uh, so to break the ice, um, Mark, are, are you familiar with Rush, uh, the rock? band i'm in canada i have to be familiar with rush of course. yeah yeah completely yeah it's but, illegal not to know rush in canada <laughs> yeah no because i'd seen uh, i'd seen your photo i was like yeah he kind of looks like geddy lee from rush just a little tiny <laughs> bit just the, the you know the thing monday warrior mean mean stride today's tom sawyer mean just the the hair going going on. It's it's like a yeah, only this long right now. But oh, no. <laughs> yeah. not it's been longer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But no, it's just exciting to to talk to you. I'm just going to try and keep my my train of my train of thought. It's totally great. So, Mark, um, your um, your your second name, your double your double barreled name, like where where does that come from? Do you know L Laren? Like where does that part come from? Okay, it my it's my stepfather's last name. Oh, so oh, actually, from closer to your part of the world than mine. Mm -hmm. So, Laren's Norwegian. Oh, so apparently, when I've when I've visited his relatives in Norway, I've been told that it's supposed to be more like Laren. I'm going, no, no, Laren's enough. Le but <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mom remarried when I was a kid, and I wanted to take my stepfather's name and change my name to Mark Laren. And was told you can't do that. That's just a phase you're going through. Mm -hmm. And when I, <clears throat> the, basically, the day I became old enough to change my name legally, I was telling all my friends I was going to change my name, and they went, "Are you out of your mind?" Because I was already working as a journalist mm -hmm. as a teenager, and all of them were going, "Laren Young is such a good byline." You know, there are other Larens out there, there are other Youngs out there, but there are no other Laren Youngs in the world. Mm -hmm. So. I went, okay, I'll keep it as a byline, but it won't be my real name. And it's both. No. Right. So, I mean, I, leg I did legally change it, but I actually legally changed it to Laren Young. Uh -huh. No, it's cool. No, I did I did wonder, because I, I thought to myself, is that Scottish? Is that, uh, I thought, could that be Irish? But the the, Le the Laren part. But, uh, no, that's interesting, yeah. that Norwegian. Young is actually one of those... Jewish names that got changed in North America. So it's actually was the same as Weird Al's last name, Yankovic. Um, oh, we see. But that's that predates me. Predates me by a fair bit when it was Yankovic. But uh yeah, so that's the name. That's the name of history. And I interviewed Weird Al and asked if we were related, but apparently our families are from different parts of Europe. My ancestors are from the Ukraine a few generations ago, and I think his were Romanian. Oh, I see. No, I was thinking about what you'd said about your friend, uh, your your good buddy uh, Scott McNeil, the voice of Wolverine in one of the one of the X Men shows. With oh, Scott has been the voice of pretty much everybody. Yeah. And what's really funny is that when Scott and I went to high school together, we actually 
used to goof around and do voices in classes together and make our teachers nuts. And he was so far and away the best actor in my high school in Vancouver that I would write plays with Scott in mind. So like there was one play where I imaginatively actually named the character Scott because I was like, no, only Scott can play this. And then Scott got cast in a real play, couldn't do my play, and I had to take over and play Scott in my play. I did not do a very good job as Scott. Oh, but oh, so much of my earliest work, I cast Scott. Mm. And when I got my very first job in animation, I was hired by uh, Reboot, a show called Reboot. And you know the story behind that was quite wild how I got that gig. But basically, I had written, if you know TV, the best way to break into TV used to be you would write what was known as a spec episode of a TV series. So you'd write a fake episode of a TV series you'd like, and that will be shown as your sample of work. I had written a spec episode of The X-Files because The X-Files was shooting in Vancouver. I had a bunch of friends who were working on it. They said they could get me scripts. Mm -hmm. So I could actually study a script, right? This is pre-internet. You couldn't just get the script of your favorite show. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they could sneak scripts out of the X-Files for me to study it. That's what I'm going to write. So I wrote my own, my spec episode of the X-Files. Somebody at Reboot reads that episode, decides it's great, and that I'm clearly going to be an X-Files writer. And so they hired me to do a parody episode of the X-Files. They wanted that because Gillian Anderson at the time was married to one of the people working at mainframe animation. She was married to one, I think it was one of the animators. And so she was going to do a cameo as Jada Nully in this reboot episode. So they thought, oh, well, if she's doing it, for sure, David Duchovny will do it. David Duchovny was like, there's no way I'm doing a cartoon. I hardly think the FBI is concerned with matters like that. So they went, oh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to find somebody who can play Fax Mulder, who can do the Fox Mulder character? And they were panicking, going, do we just cut him out. I'm like, you can't do x you know, Fox Mulder. And I went, I've got this friend. My friend's named Scott McNeil. He can be anybody. So they called Scott McNeil to try out as Fax Modem, and then he became like just a fixture on Reboot, but also a fixture at Mainframe. Like, it wasn't his first animation gig, mm. but it was one of his early ones. And you mentioned Beast Wars. He was practically everybody in Beast Wars. Mm. And when I wrote the Beast Wars script that I wrote, I actually went to Scott's house and said, I need to know if I got this right. Can you read this for me? Mm. And Scott did every freaking voice. <laughs> so I got a complete read. I, I wish I had a recording of that because I know that Scott has a lot of fans, but he did every single voice in my Beast Wars episode to go, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. No, that doesn't quite sound like that character. And so I had a huge edge writing my Beast Wars episode. And then I wrote, there was another series I'd done in the Vancouver called Dragon Booster. And Scott was like the evil henchman. And I went, I'm ready. I was pitching episodes. And I, went, I pitched an episode where the evil henchman takes over from the bad guy. So he wrote the all Scott McNeil episode of Dragon Booster. They could have a gig. And when I did my first movie, which I directed, Scott actually kicks off the movie. My old man was logger. His old man was logger. His old man fished, but, but he lived in Norway. So. Oh. so we've known each other forever. And I put him in. I, I wrote a stage play where same thing. I needed somebody who could do a jillion voices. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's got to be Scott McNeil. Mm -hmm. So I've written for him for stage. I've written for him for theater. And I've written for him for film. He's, he's a wonderful performer. No, completely. No, uh, there, there's a couple of things. Uh, one one is we, we sort of touched on the first question about your experience working on Beast Wars, which we'll, we'll come to that, where um, I think I've seen a few times like the behind the scenes with the voiceover cast on, on Beast Wars. I have the DVDs. I should have should have dug those out. But in post, I can superimpose those those DVD covers. Oh, cool. Yeah, I know. No, I've watched the show through. And um, yeah, I think because uh, he voiced Dino Bot, I think in that in that show if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Optimus is insane to waste my talents on a futile hunt. I know he was Waspinator. Waspinator, yeah. No, Inferno, not wait for your signal. I remember yeah. him being Waspinator. Yeah. Uh I, I, I can hear I know him so well I can hear his voice when he's yeah, yeah. doing characters. I'll yeah. be watching cartoon and go, ah, it's Scott. 
Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, there are those voice those voice actors like Rob Paulson or Maurice LaMarche or even like um, you know some of the cast of like SpongeBob and you know thing things like that. That that it's it's very clearly them. They have this this range that they have, but you can still kind of pick up on that. They're like, oh, that's fun. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm I'm also friends with Gary Chalk, who was in Reboot and Beast Wars as well. He was Optimus Prime. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sorry about your friend. I know how much he meant to you. And I teach a course. Mm. Actually, I briefly took over a very popular course at the University of Victoria. I'm hanging out at the University of Victoria tonight because we've got better Wi-Fi than I do at home. And uh, there's a course built around Pixar mm -hmm. and storytelling through Pixar. And then out of that, I've actually, I teach courses built around the Marvel universe and the DC universe. But when I was teaching the Pixar course, I brought in Gary Chalk to talk about life as a voiceover actor. I, I zoomed him in to my classes and he talked about being Optimus Prime. He's done so much fun stuff with Optimus Prime. Because I was going to say that that voice, I thought it's not Peter Cullen. It's definitely, it's, it's, you know, it's its own thing, like listening to Beast yeah. Wars. Because like with that show, like the Generation 1 Transformers, I do really love. Like that's something you know that I'm familiar with because well you know who's who's not but uh, I think Beast Wars might have been the first show like I'm actually curious I really because thought, being but. where you are do you pick up the Canadian accent in any of these characters do uh, they sound Canadian to you or do they just sound like generically American when you're a child you don't really notice this I think um, but from what other people have said like you know based on on the show um you know you do you do kind of pick up on that and with uh it's sort of like touching on ace lightning again because it's uh it's filmed in in toronto but it's set in in the united states it's supposed to be i don't know i don't know if they ever that's how most things in canada are made. <laughs> But you pick up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you do, you do pick up on that, like the, you know, that dialect that comes through. It's like ah, it's Canadian. It's a, you know, Canadian yeah. shot, Canadian cast, written by Canadians. You know, uh, for the most, for the most part, yeah. So I, I pick up on that stuff now because I'm more actively looking for that. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Now I was going to say since we're doing Beast Wars and you just talked about being Canadian, the Beast Wars story was so I actually pitched it as Tigatron leaves the Beast Wars and moves to Canada. Oh, oh. That, that was part of my pitch. I should, I should see if I can dig up the original pitch for it. But with Beast Wars, I had done these two episodes of Reboot. So I actually wrote the X-Files episode, and then I wrote the finale for the second season. And then I met with the guy at ABC Television who became the showrunner for season three, who basically became the story editor for season three. Mm -hmm. And they decided to move the writing to Los Angeles. Oh. And everything was done in Los Angeles. I was very much in Vancouver. Uh, but the people at Mainframe were going, well, we're doing this other show now. We're doing the show called Beast Wars. And I really didn't know much about Transformers at the time. And so I studied it. I watched every episode. And <clears> went, I'm not really great with shows where there's a lot of violence, right? And Beast Wars was like, robots shoot other robots. So I thought, what is a pitch that I could do that is very me? And I came up with, it was like jokingly called the pacifist episode of the Beast, the Beast Wars or the environmentalist episode of the Beast Wars because my pitch was the kind of pitch you could only make if you didn't know how cartoons worked, right? Because I'd only ever done two in my life. I'd done the two reboots. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I didn't know that you could not kill a character and I proposed killing a character. And so what I proposed was that Tigatron had a tiger buddy who was an actual tiger. And I thought, what if the actual tiger is killed as collateral damage when the robots are fighting it out? And Tigatron realizes that the robots can regenerate endlessly, but the planet and the animals on the planet can't regenerate and when they die, they're really dead. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing this line about Tigatron basically drips a tear mm -hmm. made of oil oh. when this tiger dies. Snowstalker! And I, I've actually run into people who went, you traumatized me through my entire childhood. I cried during a Transformers episode. <laughs> it's hilarious. I've like the response to that have been amazing. Mm -hmm. And like I met uh, John Poser, who directed the episode, and he basically said at one point, do you have any idea what you did for my career? 
because <laughs> that is such a famous episode and I got to tell such a fun story. And it was so hilarious because I remember pitching it to uh, Larry Dottilio at Beast Wars, who's this ridiculously seasoned animation writer. And him sort of explained to me, you're doing things we can't normally do Politically, at the time, there were these lobby groups in the United States who had declared Transformers the most violent show on television. Was it was this in the eighties or? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking, the, like the most violent show on on children's television. Uh, wait a few. Not even close anymore. Yeah, right? I don't know. Well, wait, wait, wait a few years until the uh, Power Rangers comes out. Which uh, the funny thing is with um, with Beast Wars, it was very much like animal themed, or you know, like dinosaurs, yeah. and giant bugs for the for the antagonists and the protagonists are more like mammals and stuff like that it's interesting because that that show is ni ni 1997 so uh mark i i would have been one that that year so i didn't see nice. it the first time around uh, that's how young i am but uh but like i i got to grow up on it because it, it gets repeated a lot you know well, it's it was just doesn't do because like what I was told was that because these parents this parents council in the states was protesting it, this episode sort of became see it's about something. So basically, what happened was I got to write this episode, and it was like said known as the pacifist episode of Beast of Beast Wars, and I knew that it had done well because I started reading online. Uh, other people taking credit for it. And I was like, nah, this was 100% my pitch. Mm -hmm. um, I could dig up the pitch document. I can dig up the script that Scott did before anybody saw it, but Scott and I. Uh, but it was such a fun story to write. And if you looked at my stuff, I do a phenomenal amount of environmental writing. Like I host a, I host a podcast about orcas, sharks, the environment, and ocean life. And... People are like, how does that connect the cartoons? Like, it doesn't, except sometimes it does. No, this is the thing about, you know, the varied richness that you have as a writer because, you know, you've tackled so many different kinds of things. And discovering what you do now, I thought, oh, that's very different. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny. I've just always loved storytelling and age range doesn't matter to me. You know, the medium doesn't matter to me. The genre really doesn't matter to me. And I'll kind of try anything. So, but it's interesting because I wrote an adult book uh, called "The Killer Whale Who Changed the World" oh, yeah. about the first orca, the, the first orca ever in captivity, and I was approached by one of Canada's top children's publishers, and they went, "Would you consider adapting this for kids? Have you ever written for kids?" I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I've written animation for all ages. Like I've done everything from." preschool to you know the stuff we're talking about today so next thing i knew i was writing a baby book i was writing a book for elementary school kids i was writing a book for middle school kids uh on whales then another one on sharks and right now i'm working on a middle school book about octopus so yeah flipping around a lot it's a lot of fun yeah. no it's crazy talking of um animation and vo uh, going back a little bit talking about voiceovers but um with um with beast wars like i was gonna say that the trend it, it's interesting um thinking about like not so much the transformers franchise but the power rangers franchise you know that was yeah, really, really big in the '90s as well. You know, it's it's interesting because uh, Beast Wars kind of had that nature theme that Power Rangers started with, with their mecha. You know, but uh, the funny thing, Mark, is that uh, I, I don't know if you were familiar with the show in 1997, but they they'd rebranded and it was uh, Power Rangers Turbo, so it was like car themed. So it was kind of the reverse, where like the Transformers are normally cars, and now they're animals in this yeah. this show, and then the Power Rangers. Oh you know became cars for turbo and it's um it's sort of like there wasn't much of a natural progression here like dinosaurs and ancient animals for the first you know season and then like mythic creatures ancient animals for the second one and then like uh, let's think uh, ninja themed stuff with some animal stuff in there as well and then like mysticism and just like robot fighting machines and then cars it's sort of like oh how do we get I should I should mention this about here. Beast Wars. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me is you get different things that set off Americans versus Canadians. Mm -hmm. And in the States, they tend to censor sex. In Canada, we tend to censor, censor violence. Mm -hmm. So in the States, it's like sex and religion. 
tend to be the, the hot buttons. Here it's violence. So in Canada, we did not have Beast Wars. We had Beasties. I was going to say. You could not have a cartoon name. with the name Wars on it. Mm -hmm. So the Canadian version of the show was, was Beasties. Yeah, which is which is funny because beasties is like a Scottish word for bugs, actually, which is kind of funny. I was thinking that. Yeah, I I, I learned that. I've seen the the bumper or the the alternate tag for it. I'm like, is that a thing? Because it, it's strange as a you know as a Scottish guy what seeing that like that's really really funny in a way that's not intended. You know, I can't remember how I know this or what book I read, but somehow I just. Vaguely remember the term "we beasties" as a Scottish yeah. thing. Yeah, little bugs. Is that so? That's bugs. Yeah, or or like um, yeah, bugs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. No, the funny thing I was going to say, Mark, is uh, talking of um, of the voice cast, uh, not of not of Beast Wars for a second, but um, with um, with the original X Men cartoon with uh, Cal Dodd, who's the voice of Wolverine, who's actually coming back for X Men '97. So they're going to do a new season of um, of that show, like continuity, and try and bring back. Nice. So I just thought, sold, great, that'll be good. That'll be good to hear Cal's voice again. Because he was on Ace Lightning, that's the big connection uh, to Ace Lightning. He was Random Virus, who's one of the, you know, was kind of between the good side and the bad because he had a split. Yep. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite characters, uh, although he kind of terrified me, but I kind of loved it. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> just Just the way he was able to... You know, to do to do that, like you pitiful scarecrow. Now you're only prolonging your annihilation. You pitiful scarecrow. <laughs> now you're only prolonging your annihilation. <laughs> and then going back to being a good guy, just like Ace, what happened? How'd I get here? Ace, what happened? How'd I get here? You wouldn't believe it if I told you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know stuff like that. But no, with with Cal, he um he's uh, he's Canadian though he's uh, Irish born actually, and uh, okay. so Cal is the C C A L is is the name that he goes by. But uh, he was in an interview; it was a audio only. I'll need to send it to you because it's really good. And uh, so uh, the guy interviewing him used his uh, Irish Gaelic name, which uh, it's it's spelt Cathal C A T H A L though i know but it's it's pronounced kahal because you don't you don't pronounce the t so kahal <laughs> and uh, i don't even think i've seen that name before that's great yeah i know it's uh, and i felt really bad because i thought oh no i've been calling him kathal as well but if you don't know how to pronounce that name you know because yeah. he was he was saying to the guy like no, i'm going to stop you right there because you said you said kathal he's like how, how, how do you pronounce your name dude he's like well i, I don't even go by that name <laughs> you know he was he was saying about how um it, it was short to Cal because uh, I think when he was in school he was he was young in uh, Port Dover Ontario and uh, yeah he was like yeah we were all ingrained and the, the kids couldn't pronounce it so Cal goes he goes home he's like mom dad we have to do something about this name because they're they're calling me bovine they're calling me cattle <laughs> and I'm like that's gonna turn to cow so yeah just so he's like so we got rid of cow <laughs> and uh, yeah so just Cal cool yeah. yeah. Honestly, it's in, it's interesting he didn't go with Carl because Carl's closer to Carl, but I guess you just take what's there and you just shrink it and you get Cal. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So uh, I want to say, Mark, because I, I read your your blog post about um, about Beast Wars that you you sent to me a, a little while ago, actually. And no, it was really really informative. You know, just talking about when you were a journalist and you know, kind of what informed the kind of pacifism kind of angle on the on on the character, which does really work because that was kind of what Tigertron was was like. He was a good guy, but he wasn't that much of a fighter. Yeah. Uh, I like I liked him a lot. I had uh, well, not personally, but I knew someone that had like a little Tigertron toy that you could buy, and uh, you can get those like reissues of them. And uh, maybe maybe when this is over, I'll go and I'll just go grab one off eBay. I'm like, oh, this is good. Yeah, I've actually picked up Tigertron toys at conventions here and stuff like that. Cause I'm like, yeah, that's my guy. 
Yeah, yeah. But no, we kind of uh, we kind of talked about your experience working working on Beast Wars. But uh, I understand that um, you kind of uh, did. You feel you learned about like the pitching process for how these things tend to tend to work, and it's like you have to keep coming up with ideas and. Oh yeah, uh, but so much of that was basically written by the guys who created it. Yeah. So it's like I did the episode, everybody was happy, and then it was like, yeah, we're you know, there's really nothing to pitch. Mm. because they had, you know, they sort of had their stable of writers and the team at mainframe was, you know, going, well, you, you got your episodes like, great. And I, I moved, to, I'm trying to remember this. I think I moved to Toronto fairly soon after that as well. Um, and started writing cartoons there, which is how I ended up with Ace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But if you'd asked me two years earlier, I had no idea that we had any cartoons being made in Canada. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I'd never written for TV. I, oh. I got my first, you know, animation job out of doing uh, stage comedy. Mm -hmm. So most of the TV that I knew in Canada was stuff that was like service productions. So American shows shot in Canada. Yeah. So I, I knew which American shows shot in Canada were there. there were a handful of Canadian shows. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing that ever really felt like my kind of thing. Like, even if I watched it, nothing felt like the kind of thing I wrote, but cartoons instantly. Like, as soon as I was like, hang on, I can write superhero stories? I'm so in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? That was just so exciting. Mm -hmm. I was like, immediately, I was going, I did not know that this was a life option for me, that I could write superhero stories. That was just so cool right it's like this is my favorite thing ever and you know here here's an avenue for for that pretty much i i had assumed it was all written in america mm -hmm. right so i had assumed you had to live in la mm -hmm. and then reboot sure enough basically moved over to la mm -hmm. uh, and i mean i had this phenomenal meeting with um like i said the guy who took over reboot dan didio who eventually took over dc comics Years later, Dan actually let me pitch a Batman, but I my timing was off because they were about to launch the new 52. So I pitched something that made no sense with the new 52. No. But it was amazing to me that I was actually pitching a Batman comic. It was very weird. I had this huge collection of comic books. And after I pitched a Batman, I was like, I don't think I need the collection anymore. I almost got rid of Batman. And I also got to write uh, a Moon Knight series but not the Moon Knight series that eventually made it on TV. No, no. There was an attempt to do a live action Moon Knight for Marvel. Um, long before Oscar Isaac, yeah. Long before, long before the MCU, uh -huh. where it was spinning out of the Blade TV series. And then we're going to do a Moon Knight TV series. Well, I know with, with Moon Knight, like a lot of the characters, the, the difficulty, you know, it's not a, a problem now, but like crossovers, because uh, I think he interacted a lot with Spider-Man, which obviously... You know, you can do that now, kind of, but um, yeah, it's it's sort of like the it, it's defined a lot by like the shared universe stuff, which we've come to know and really love now in the movies and stuff. But like, it's sort of like um, you know, I know with the MCU when it began, there's a good behind the scenes with the first Iron Man movie talking about we've got ambitions to do a, a cinematic universe. What do we have the rights to? It's like okay, we don't have Spider Man, we don't have the Fantastic Four. We don't have the X-Men, we do now, but we didn't have those then. And it's like, well, we've always had the rights to Nick Fury and, you know, everything else pretty much, like Captain America and Iron Man, you know, Hulk. They were able to negotiate strenuously with Universal Pictures. And, you know, it's sort of like we, we've got what we've got. Let's try and mingle them all and just take that idea with what's here, you know, in-house. Teaching a course here in the Marvel Universe, it's interesting to explain to students <clears throat> yeah, Iron Man was not a big deal character. Now the movies have happened. Now he's the guy. Yeah. But prior to the movies, Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America—they were the B list man. Mm -hmm. they, like the A list, they didn't have the rights to. Mm -hmm. It was Spider Man. It was Elektra. It was X Men. Yeah. It was Wolverine. Yeah. All right. Uh, and it's fascinating now to go. You know, because of the way the MCU built, mm -hmm. the phenomenal shift of. Iron Man suddenly becoming a superstar. Uh -huh. Hulk, you know, Hulk becoming a bigger deal. These were all characters whose comics kept getting canceled. Oh, man. Right? Like the number of times those comics got canceled when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and, or they didn't have their own comics initially. And yeah, they turned into, you know, they were in Tales from Astonish or whatever. It does explain right? a lot because there was kind of a stark 
with the uh, with the movies i know like um they took a lot of influence from like 60s marvel you know for you know yeah. about the iron man movies but also uh, like you know the new avengers like stuff from the time like the 2000s stuff like uh you know so it sort of explains like the the cut from one to the other because as you say yeah. they kept getting cancelled but also like we'll go with what's most relevant but like yeah with iron man i think for the most part no one really cared or knew who he was until the movie i know for me i'd seen yeah. when the iron man movie came out i knew who he was because of the spider man cartoon actually because they crossed over I'm like, yep. oh, where War Machine comes in, it's like, we've got to bring him back up. Who? The guy named Iron Man. <laughs> but um, with Beast Wars, we, we've talked uh, you know, about your experiences working on that and what kind of informed it. But do you feel that carried forward, like the pitching idea, you know, into other other things that you've done where it's like things things don't necessarily come to you as a writer like you know you have to you know you, you have to go and set up your ideas and stuff well beach wars like i hadn't really thought about it until you asked but beast wars was the first time i'd ever pitched uh -huh. because i was invited to do the reboot right like they basically what happened with the reboot was because they'd read my x files they went would you do this parody episode of x files and most of the stuff that was shifted from my original script was because I didn't understand the things you couldn't, couldn't do in CGI yet. Mm -hmm. So I, in the original version of my script for a reboot, I had a character called the smoking can after cancer man, Bill Davis uh, from the X-Files did not realize that one of the hardest things to do in animation or in, in CGI at the time, smoke, water, fire. Mm -hmm. So of course, what I pitched to transformers was fire. Right, like I really, because nobody bothered to explain that to me, because this was the beginning of CGI, I and mean, this was happening same time as Pixar was launching, right? So this was pioneering CGI, this, from the people who did the Dire Straits music video that launched the idea of CG animation. So I did that, which was a request, and then while I was doing that, we were talking about characters and I, because I am a comic nerd, I get obsessed with backstory. I get obsessed with the characters, like the forgotten characters. If you watch most episodes of TV that I've written, I'll choose a side character to feature because I'll, I will go back. I'll watch every episode. I'll read the Bible and you'll so often see that there was something they were in love with that never made it into the show. And that becomes my pitch. I'll pitch the, who's the character who's underused, right? Who's the character that somebody clearly loved and then forgot about? And those tend to be my pitches. But what happened was I started asking about the Guardians in Reboot. And I said, what's their deal? And they said, really, they're just Bob's boss. And we started talking about that. And I said, look, are you, I'm serious comic nerd. And as a comic nerd, I've always loved Green Lantern. And I've always thought that the Guardians in Green Lantern are raging assholes. Oh. And this was before they actually did a series where they became that. But I always, I never liked them. So I said, what if the Guardians in Reboot are raging assholes? And they loved that pitch. Like I, remember, like I vividly remember sitting in this conference room and then went, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. So next thing I knew... I was being asked to turn my episode into a two-parter, which was the series finale. They already knew what they wanted to do. They were like, they knew that they were getting canceled off ABC. They knew they were going to end with a big war. They informed me that they were going to kill off Bob, who was the lead character. And so they basically went, here are the pieces, put them into the story. So I thought that was how TV worked. Yeah. And then I was invited to do Beast Wars. And they said, so what story is you pitching? And I went, what do you mean what story is I pitching? And I went and like, it's funny, this is now a trick I teach writing students. It's like, I went and looked up like every classic Western story because all of the plots are in classic Western somewhere. Mm -hmm. the, the, if you ever doubt that, watch Mandalorian and the entire first two seasons, you can play name that classic Western. Oh, 100%. now they're doing yeah. Stagecoach. <clears throat> now they're doing Shane. Yeah. Now they're like, like they've done every single Western in Mandalorian. Yeah. I was like, okay, what <clears throat> things I like? So I pitched like an enemy mind version of what, of like, I didn't always know 
where the, the original stories had come from, right? Yeah. In my early 20s, it's like, like I pitched all of these different stories and I can't remember how many I had all together. But then I remember it was like, Tigatron leaves the Beast Wars, moves to Canada, um, you know, and that the pitch that got made into the story. Mm-hmm. And they just, I really do think what they liked about it, my understanding was that what they liked about it was that, like I said, no one who understood how cartoons worked would have thought to pitch and now we kill a character. Mm-hmm. And the really the unforgettable moment for me of working on Beast Wars was having this phone call with Larry Detilia where we were talking about whether one character's heat powers could beat Tigatron's cold powers. Yeah, yeah. And I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. And he said, what's so funny? And I went, I, I'm so sorry, but I remember having this argument about Iceman versus Human Torch when mm. I was a little kid. Mm. And I was like with David Cates, like my, my childhood friend David Cates, playing on his jungle gym. Yeah, yeah. And getting into arguments over whether Human Torch could beat Iceman. I was Team Iceman. He was Team Torch. Mm-hmm. And I also argued that Green Lantern could beat Superman with enough willpower, right? And going, oh my God, I am being paid to have this argument with an adult, this is like the best thing in my life ever. I remember reading thought, that in your, your post. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. really amazing. You know, just to right. Like, that, yeah. yeah, I couldn't remember if I put that in my post, but I really do. I vividly recall that moment going, this is like the best thing in my life ever. And I remember when I got it, when I've been working in TV for years, and I remember I had a TV agent and I said, seriously, if I ever, ever complain about getting to write cartoons, let me go because it means I've forgotten why I write. Oh, right. Like just cut me loose because I just don't deserve to do it anymore because it's just like, seriously, I'm getting paid to make believe superheroes. It is so great. Mm. Right. What a great thing to get to do. No, so, that's, that's golden. That's, that's all in there. I do yeah. really love that part, but we'll see, we'll see what happens with the, you know, what they end up doing with their movies now, because, uh, you know, Iceman versus Human Torch, you know, we could have a little brawl there because we can, we be- could actually now my favorite though, Mark, when I say favorite, my idea was to have like an interaction similar to the first Avengers where Iron Man, Captain America and Thor meet, but instead have Hulk and, and beast and the thing you know just see what we could you know what we could do with that oh that would be that fun would, yeah can we get george boozer back that, that, that would be great user that works he has a little cameo in the first x-men actually he's a truck driver at the beginning oh cool i thought you said you're gonna take me as far as laughlin city this is laughlin city We'll be able to maybe see some some people, like the new shows or the new movies, just to see if we can, just like a little Easter egg for fans of the, the cartoons. Yeah. We like have Cal Dodd, you know, somewhere in the background or like, you know, other other people like that, who, whoever we can do. I'm like, that's that's really fun. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, it's been out for a few months now. It'll probably be on streaming, but uh, they made a new uh, Transformers movie, the uh, Transformers Rise of the Beasts film. One of my questions that I've listed is I asked you if, if you were excited to see that. and I, I think I actually I, did I want to see it, but I haven't checked it out yet. No, I, I think I had to tell you that, that, that it existed. I think you said, did not know this was happening. I'm like, oh, fun. I knew there was a new Transformers. I had no idea it was, it was the Beasts. Yeah. So I really do want to check that out, but I haven't seen it yet. I would recommend seeing it because, no, I I did enjoy it quite a bit, but I thought to myself, this isn't really a movie, you know, without spoiling anything, really. This isn't a movie necessarily made for me as a fan of Beast Wars because it's trying to be its own thing, for one, which you have to do. But also it's like, it's a movie that they happen to be in rather than it just being about them because some of the Generation 1 characters are in there, I think, just to try and make try and bridge bridge the gap between the two where it's like we have to committee thinking we have to have the familiar stuff in there and I, I was watching it and kind of laughing to myself I saw it with a friend thinking that you know the idea is the tagline is robots in disguise, robots in disguise. 
you know the transformers and i was looking at the you know the cgi for the for the beast characters i thought this looks really awesome this looks really cool but i thought you know they they don't blend in i thought they don't they they look like the robot cheetah looks like a robot cheetah it doesn't look like a real cheetah the same with optimus primal and i just thought congratulations guys in in neither of your forms do you blend in you know i'm like this it's kind of weird to you know like objectively this i thought this doesn't work but i'm like i i don't care i, I don't care yeah. it's, still, it's still fun but uh you know a question, I suppose, is uh, have you seen many of the Paramount Pictures uh, Transformers movies, the Michael Bay ones? Like, do you have you a seen a few of them? I haven't watched a ton of them. I haven't watched, oh. like, I haven't watched all of them, mm -hmm. but I've seen a few. They're fun. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not, they're not really my thing. No, no. The we Marvel stuff, yeah. The DC stuff, yeah. Hit and miss. Yeah. No, I just ask because with with the Michael Bay films, full disclosure, folks, this this uh, video is not sponsored by Paramount or anything like that. But like, uh, and if it, and if it were, I'm failing badly because like with the Michael Bay films, I think I gave up after number three just because it was really long and overblown, and I just thought, Ugh. you know, because I, I I was a kid, I, I enjoyed the first two, and then I thought it's difficult to keep getting invested because I, I felt the i felt the formula come through and i'm like there's no yeah. story progression here when there really could be whereas like you know like marvel movies they're able to do that yep but yeah the bizarre thing was uh this doesn't spoil the beast wars movie but they kind of at the very end they had uh our our main guy is handed this card and it's like you know join us call us and the calling card, it says G.I. Joe. I was like, G.I. Joe, are you? Oh, it's another Hasbro brand. I'm like, this is kind of funny. You know, it's like the, the cross pollination. Like, let's yeah. uh, throw another one of our toy brands in there. I thought, but where, where is this going? I thought, I'd love to see a good crossover, uh, you know, a crossover with the Hasbro stuff that they have. Yeah. Like, is this going to be a thing? I don't know. Uh, it was just just a funny funny little moment <laughs> but no i'd recommend i'd recommend seeing it you know just just cool. uh, you know see what they ended up doing because it, it was it was pretty cool but i don't i don't know where where this is going 